Hello, everybody. Welcome. Hoping that my wind buffer hack, which is a cotton ball spiral wrapped with a bread wire around the microphone that attaches to my wired earpieces. I hope that's working. I'm kind of proud of the hack. Because it, it usually it works really well and it's essentially free. A uh, little bit blustery at the moment today. I'm out walking around the lake. Uh, don't necessarily have a specific topic in mind. But we will see where, where this goes. Um, had a long conversation with my son last night in which a variety of conflicting perspectives arose, not just between us, which is not uncommon. My son likes to joust with me as many uh, I can't speak for the, the women, but as, as many male children do, I like to joust with pops. Um, so he was, his sort of position was, you know, it's all beautiful, it's all Maya. He studies Advaita Vedanta and practices in that tradition. And I have a long history of um, Zen study, although I'm not particularly active these days in that. Uh, and, and some, you know, a broad uh, palette of spiritual and philosophical stuff, which I'm a bit of a gadfly about, right? I flutter, I drink from this flower, that flower without usually going very deep. Um, but I like to think, and I'm... <laughs> I like to think. Yeah, that's the beginning of most of my trouble. Uh, I'm very concerned about the welfare of living beings and the reduction of suffering. <clears throat> and uh, my argument was primarily that... Uh, most of the, a vast portion anyway, of the suffering on our planet is egregiously caused by what might be referred to as the replicators, replicator branch of humans. Um, I'm, I'm adopting this, this uh, language from a Demystify Psy podcast where there were a couple of consciousness researchers and they, one of them was speaking about the difference between the replicators and the team, uh, team makers. And most of the malignant stuff in our culture, societies, civilizations, nations, and so forth, it comes from the replicators. Um, or at least this is how I understood it. Obviously, uh, well, one, one reasonable example is that my son had recently attended the funeral of his nephew who was uh, suffered a, a catastrophic birth defect and had been kept alive by machines for a long time and was recently taken off life support and passed away. And my son was quite upset with the Christian preacher who was saying things like, you know, I won't use the, the child's name, but this child is now in heaven and the only chance for any of you to ever see him again is to join our religion. And my son was like, you know, I don't think the man's intentionally evil. Uh, 
but using someone's death as an opportunity to blackmail people into joining your religion, that's a replicator strategy. You can see how the religions have been weaponized over time with, you know, threats of eternal damnation, uh, ev you know, eviction from the goodwill of the divine beings and all of these things. And it's wildly unlikely, you know, I don't know really of any story uh, where someone encounters God or an angel and it's just wrath, right? hatred, vitriol, threats of eternal punishment, you know. There might be such stories, I've just never encountered them. Those seem to be later editions, edi you know, editorial <laughs> uh, introductions by way of attempting to assert that, you know, I don't even know what, to blackmail people into love. How, I mean, how can you blackmail someone into love? You're just going to threaten them? You better love me or torture? Forever? Does that actually sound like a divine being? Love me or I'll destroy you. I mean, what kind of love would result from such a threat anyway? Right? The whole idea is absurdly ridiculous. So, my son and I were, you know, my, my position is, yes, I understand the play of Maya, the, you know, my son's in love with the feminine aspect of the divine, which I can certainly understand that. <clears throat> and he wants everyone to have a, a taste of this nectar, this divine milk of origin, bliss, ecstasy, freedom, that is the, you know, commonly available to anyone willing to do a little bit of work. Uh, and I don't disagree with him, but I think that the common person is too confused and, what, frightened and compromised nine ways to Sunday by the representational layer that the replicators build and sustain in human culture and language. Um, though some of them will escape that. You know, my son seems upset that he can point in the direction of liberty and bliss and everybody's like, yeah, you know, rather watch this TV show. Why don't you, why don't we watch Judge Judy? You know, which is basically the, <laughs> the relational equivalent of eating your own vomit or something, or eating someone else's vomit. Um, so he's a little confused about that. I, not so much. I understand how people are compelled to remain in the, uh, in the representational layer and, and behave around in there, just be captured by um, this addiction, that addiction this sensory experience, this defection from uh, the fears of death. Um, you know, and some of us chase various kinds of excellence even within the representational layer through exercise, self-improvement, education, uh, communal endeavor, Um, play, mutual play, dance, music making, comedy, theater, all kinds of art. And I'm personally, I think that uh, artistic, creative, and playful behaviors among humans are very enriching. Um, they can be captured and weaponized, and they often are. Uh, but that, but fundamentally, they're still, it seems to me, virtuous. 
if we are concerned with you know, uh, distinguishing between virtue and its counterfeits and or opposites. Thank you. Nobody's gonna touch it though. I mean that concern when it becomes a primary focus uh, is is often as many concerns are often becomes interestingly ironic. In other words, productive of results opposite to those um, <laughs> seen as desirable. So we have to be careful about becoming too fanatical about the pursuit of virtue. However, in, a, in the right kind of context, for example, in a monastic uh, context, one can discover, and even in a secular context with the right orientation, one will discover that um, the inhibition or refusal to admit into one's behavioral repertoire, vices, addictions, um, uncareful relations with food, pleasure, so forth. Uh, what Jordan Peterson might call licentiousness, which is kind of a, a relatively Christian-esque word. Um, one will discover that the, the active inhibition of um, dangerous, slippery slopes relatively quickly produces unexpected benefits. Um, this is part of why in many monastic traditions uh, the nuns or monks obey a vow of silence, right? They don't speak. Um, they are conserving the energies that would otherwise be invested in speaking. And once one is speaking, as I unfortunately have learned, um, a variety of problems ensue with the preservation of um, self-interested models of identity, uh, role, history, futurity, uh, uh, cohort identification. I'm a Giants fan. Um, I'm not. I don't. If the Giants disappeared, it would have no effect on me. In fact, if the entire sports system went away, I'd be completely unconcerned. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, one discovers that, for example, the virtues of temperance and even chastity and other kinds of virtues, these are not made up. And it's, it's not merely that there's some fanatical religious person attempting to control our urges and then uh, commodifying this control and operationalizing it, weaponizing it, um, so that uh, so that there's a sort of overseer evil overlord of, of controlling us. You know, there's, there is some degree of that going on. But we don't want to throw out, you know, the, the, uh, the ship w w because one of the oars is broken. Right? 
So there's actually a benefit, I mean, not a benefit, there's a broad array of benefits that arise when we resist intelligently and carefully. We resist the, uh, the call of the lower hanging fruits of desire. Those are energetic transactions. When we eat food, when we uh, enact anger, resentment, greed, sloth, lethargy, um, these inactions over time create patterns, and so does the opposite. If we are temperate, if we are equanimous, and we have equanimity, and we do not lean too easily toward physical pleasure, um, it similarly sets up a structured pattern where the energies of our soul and incarnation and humanity uh, naturally begin to seek what we might think of as better um, modes, forms, transformations, and so forth. And so, you know, virtues, rewards are real. And the weaponization of virtue doesn't change that. Um, and I think it's uh, dumb to use this awareness uh, as a weapon of judgment, right? Oh, those people are bad because they blah, blah, blah. Well, <laughs> um, again, the, the incredible irony here is that uh, using the possibility of virtue as a weapon to judge other beings is not virtuous, right? It's whatever the opposite is, um, licentious <laughs> in, the, in the terminology of, uh, that, that Jordan was recently using. Um, I, I think that... Uh, you know, puritanical perspectives lead to a lot of dangers, but balanced, intelligent resistance of, as I said, the, the sort of practice of climbing down the ladder of our humanity toward ever lower, lower hanging fruit, which you can see groups of humans do all the time together. Um, you know, I remember when I was younger, I was fascinated by the intelligences from, from, from which comedians compose their routines. And I was like, how do they get that perspective? And now I know a little bit about that because I practiced it some and I'm old. <laughs> but uh, I, I also, you know, some of them seemed heroic to me, but the ones who seemed most heroic were the ones who didn't drag us down toward the lowest hanging fruit, uh, you know, toward vulgarity. And perhaps, um, kind of crude representations of human sexuality or behavior. I really liked the comedians who could make me laugh without, uh, you know, dragging me into the, the spiritual muck of our humanity. Uh, examples would be Robin Williams, Steve Martin, um, 
those are two that come quickly to mind. Part of what I'm trying to say here is that I believe in the value of virtue. Um, and I include this in my spiritual practice rather prominently. I want to climb up the ladder together, um, not for the sake of some puritanical, admonitory, judgmental uh, agenda, but rather because it's clear to me that um, not, and also it's not like there's an accounting game where, well, you have a spiritual debt because you were bad. I mean, that may not be entirely untrue, but it's also not the point. Yes, of course, incurring um, what we might think of as, you know, karmic uh, what? Burdens and so forth. Right? Probably not good even if there's only a single lifetime to live in. Uh, but that's not really the point. The point is there's so much of what it means to be human that's inaccessible to us while we are doodling around in the sewage of our culture and the common, you know, commodifications of vice that really are very toxic to one's soul, uh, in my view. Um, there are certainly uh, philosophers, magicians, and others who have said, oh no, that's all a bunch of nonsense. Uh, that's just puritanical control systems. Um, one, you know, relatively uh, near you know, graspable example would be um, Aleister Crowley and the OTO, the sex magic people and so forth. Uh, and then somewhat more trustworthily, uh, speaking in a very general sense, uh, tantrists and so forth. Um, again, they're not entirely wrong, but the flagrant disregard or inversion of virtue tends to be expensive and harm, you know, causal of a broad array of harms. Um, there's something delicate. And uh, important to preserve. That without the practice or concern for virtuous development or development toward virtue is lost. And once it's gone, it's very difficult to restart the process. It's much more difficult to begin climbing that ladder once you've come down a few rungs on it. It's as if the ordinary gravity that would inhibit your, one's ascent, and particularly the ascent of a group, uh, is magnified dramatically so that to make even a slight ascent becomes surprisingly more difficult. Um, one example is the way that uh, vices link together to form chains of oppression in our lives, hearts, behavior, relationships, and so forth, right? So that if you have a kind of a fundamental compromise going on, let's say that one drinks quite a bit every night, this naturally leads to other behaviors and um, deprivations, which are painful, 
that support the continuance of the drinking habit, which is a kind of um, defection from what? Like self-determination? It's much easier to just defect, drink, and then it becomes much easier from there to, you know, continue other vices, smoking cigarettes or who knows what, um, pornography, bad television, uh, gluttonous consumption of you know, unhealthy food. Um, so you can see that, like, in a way, uh, C.S. Lewis, in writing his in his book *The Screw Tape Letters*, where demons are essentially discussing how to go about successfully compromising human souls. Um, one can easily think, oh, well, that's just a bunch of Christian propaganda. Okay, you know. But <laughs> the whole thing is like, you don't want to throw away actionable intelligence that's profoundly useful because it comes from a cohort you don't trust, right? And it kind of doesn't matter whether there are demons or damnation or anything like this um, because the features of the collapse of the moral, ethical, and relational integrity of, of, of what we might think of as a person's soul, those are real. You know, you can watch this happen in human lives all day every day if you've ever been in involved in any kind of recovery community and you listen as people tell the stories of their lives you can see how um, vice becomes a bit you know I was listening to uh, Lex Fridman talking with um, <clears throat> the jungle rescue gentleman whose name escapes me probably because I didn't actually learn it in a way that I can easily recall it. And he is so brilliant um, and, and a beautiful human being, soulful, intelligent, ethical. Um, not that he doesn't you know, make mistakes or whatever, but I, I remember hearing them talking about uh, particularly the power and um, the way an anaconda makes a kill. And the first move is to anchor. So the anaconda bites on to some portion of an animal and then generally sweeps the feet. Um, very similar to human combat. And then once the animal falls, it spin wraps it, and you're being wrapped in like a single muscle that uh, just begins a sequence of constrictions that once begun are pretty much inescapable. Um, And this really is an excellent analogy for what happens when our lives, and I'm not speaking here like philosophically or theoretically, I'm speaking here as someone who has directly experienced these things. Um, pause here for a moment. I shall return. You know, I'm speaking from first-hand experience. I have struggled with various forms of addiction, as have members of my family throughout my life. Um, when one, for example, is addicted to nicotine, uh, it radically changes all kinds of features of what's accessible and not accessible to, to you if it doesn't straight up just kill you and give you heart disease and cancer and lung disease and, right? So, 
you know, the way the, the terrible gravity that overcomes one's sense of liberty as a smoker, where, you know, every 20 to 30 minutes, you're going to have another cigarette, you're going to spend these days three to five hundred dollars a month on this habit, which is a lot of money. Um, it kills you faster and in new ways every time you engage with it. It collapses the accessible liberties and relationships that you could participate in. Because most people, many people anyway, will see you as undesirable or um, morally and or ethically weak. Um, behaviorally compromised. Uh, all of these things. So you can see that there's there's a fundamental array. It's not just the problem with you smoke cigarettes. Right? I mean, that's a lethal problem by itself, but it, it creates a web of traps that over time much like the short-term constriction of the anaconda or the boa constrictor, just keep trapping you. <laughs> um, more in, in more, uh, um, what, limiting and constrictive ways. And, it, and this is true with, with almost all habits, right? Uh, and we're very vulnerable. Mostly we are vulnerable to these things because we are lonely. And because in our, in our societies, in our cultures, it can be profoundly difficult for us to um, acquire truly meaningful roles and what I would call adventure identities or avatars, which is exactly what happens in sports teams and um, musical bands, right? Uh, in, in these two representations of excellence, um, humans are allowed uh, and encouraged to develop avatars of themselves. But we all need this, and, and the primary pain uh, that drives humans to addiction and vices, what we might call vices, is loneliness, isolation, um, the lack of meaningful roles, relationships, and, I, and relational identities in our common daily lives. Um, inside the little boxes that protect us, we think, from harm and weather and trouble and so forth, uh, there's a staggering impoverishment of movement, vitality, life, meaning, richness, creativity, play, and so, you know, we succumb to the allure of strange counterfeits of value and intelligence and play that happen on screens. Now, in our time, there is a rich backdrop of meaningful, quote, content, unquote. But to what degree does it actually engage us? I think in this city especially, because, like, the way the driveways work, there's just so many, like, You know, it's, it's what we would think of as passive entertainment, which always usually makes me kind of fidgety. I can completely get into listening to a podcast while I am uh, on a walk out in nature or something. Well, I, I mean, I don't really get to nature much, but the parks here are, are fairly similar to nature. But yeah, passive entertainment is, uh, it, 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 I find it very troubling generally. I, it's, it's difficult for me to just sit there and have something... Uh, Thank you so Have much. Enjoy. Have a good day. You too. Um, yeah, I just feel like I'm... <laughs> even when I'm having a conversation with someone I care about, I, I want physical movement. I liked, I'm a perambulator. 
I love to walk and have the somatic experience of just being alive as an animal. So much of our modernity compromises our uh, physicality, right? And just basically shuts it down, right? Just sit there and consume. Um, this is the perfect, what, uh, Petri dish for vice, right? If you start out with an array of painful impoverishments, now it becomes really easy to sell people the hot dog, you know, the, um, the MMA fight, uh, the football game, the pornography. And so much of our culture is um, like actual pornography is perhaps just a slightly more explicit version of everything else about our culture, right? Food porn, design porn, object porn, advertising porn. And it's, it's truly metaphysically weird how lethally toxic just being exposed to any kind of advertising is at all. I mean, it, whether or not there are demons, there are processes in our cultures and societies that do effectively the same damn thing. So does it really matter whether, you know, <laughs> whether there are actually malignant metaphysical beings um, of the kind we, you know, would use the words demon or devils uh, to refer to. It turns out not to matter because if the same thing's going on, it doesn't really, it doesn't make much difference whether the reified pointer exists. Um, so, you know, the vices that we fall prey to are consumptive, they are disease-like, they lay waste to our, um, to the beauty of the possibility of our human interiority and relational integrity, mutual liberation, adoration, recollection, and amnesis, wonder, play, awe, joy. Without Without these in our experience and without enacting these together, what are we doing here? Like, why are we even here? Um, you know, life is very challenging and it's vastly more challenging to whatever degree we may be isolated. Unfortunately, our technologies give us the appearance of communal identity while mostly delivering a dissection of our personal psychography to advertisers, governments, um, bad actors of not just traditional kind, but of every new kind that can possibly arise in a context that uh, basically just ma fracks our souls, our, our potentials for humanity just get fracked and the fucking remains are sold to the highest bidder all day every day. Uh, meanwhile, we invent new kinds of fracking and thus invent new kinds of parasites to profit from the results. This is evil. It doesn't matter whether there's hell. It doesn't matter whether there's Satan in this case, because the evil is real. You know, the deadly poison destroys you whether 
you know, whether it was composed by demons or chemists, it doesn't matter. It's just, it you know, kills your children just as quickly either way. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm making an argument here for the, for the mutual preservation of and attention to the possibilities of enacted relational, intellectual, communal, societal virtue. This matters. This is something we need together to help each other understand, um, to pay careful attention to, and to resist. the uh, constant parasitic um, invasion, uh, infection, contagion of the aggressively self-replicating opposites of virtue all around us, and particularly within our, what we call societies that aren't, and the technologies Um, that comprise the layer we refer to as social media, those things are fundamentally malignant. And the entities behind them uh, certainly qualify as vampiric demons, whether or not there's some metaphysical uh, malignancy giggling and wringing its hands joyfully in the background. Um, None of us are perfect. You know, I struggle with my own, with the gravity that I feel in my own life uh, that draws me both away from virtue and toward um, easily accessible seeming enjoyments uh, what we might call pleasures I think these days um, you know I have managed over the past year uh, to evict cigarettes from my life (laughs) which is a way of trying to ensure that I, I have a little more life left to me. But the, uh, the very challenging stillness, the grave-like stillness inside my little lockbox makes it necessary for me to practice um, attending the possibilities of virtue, many of which, some of which are active, right? To be actively kind, generous, forgiving, uh, merciful, intelligently balanced, non-judgmental, um, So, you know, those are active virtues, but the passive virtues mostly have to do with uh, resisting the urge to climb down that ladder um, toward the low-hanging fruit of stuff that looks like pleasure, uh, short-term, short attention span, gives you that dopamine hit, or whatever the neurotransmitters are, and then, you know, deprives you of 19 nourishing things that you might have had instead. Um, So this is my little pain to virtue and my, you know, holding up (laughs) the symbolic cross of the beautiful remembrance of our divine nature and origin. 
without indicating any specific religion. Um, this is my, my little song for today. I'm so grateful to all of you who have joined me and who participate by listening or asking questions or making comments. Um, if you find my content valuable and you have the wherewithal to do so, please visit my Patreon page. There's links on my YouTube uh, main site. And anything you can contribute would be profoundly appreciated and will help me to continue to produce quality content um, and host adventures occasionally in the actual world. I'm so grateful for this opportunity. I do not take it for granted. Um, may your lives and hearts and dreaming be beautiful, rich, comforting, and profound. Thanks for joining me. Bye-bye for now.